Fireside Christmas Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fireside Christmas Short Stories by Various Her Birthday Dream by Nellie C. King Recording by Angela Marcia Brownlow came out of the church and walked rapidly down the street. She seemed perturbed. Her gray eyes flashed, and on her cheeks glowed two red spots. She was glad she was not going home so she wouldn't have to take a car, but could walk the short distance to Aunt Sophie's, where she had been invited to dine and visit with her special chum, Cousin Jack, who was home from college for the short Thanksgiving vacation. She slowed up as she reached her destination and waited a little before going in. She wanted to get calmed down a bit, for she didn't want her friend to see her when she felt so riled up. Back of it was a secret reluctance to meet Jack. He was so different since the Gypsy Smith revival. Of course, he was perfectly lovely and unchanged toward her, but somehow she felt uncomfortable in his presence, and she didn't enjoy having her self-satisfaction disturbed. As she entered the dining room, she was greeted with exclamations of surprise and pleasure. "'Why, Marcia," said Aunt Sophia, "'we had given you up. I almost never knew of your being late in keeping an appointment. You must excuse me, Auntie, and lay this offense to the charge of our Sunday school superintendent,' answered Marcia. "'I suppose Mr. Robinson is laying his plans for Christmas,' remarked Uncle John. "'He believes in taking time by the forelock, and a very commendable habit it is, too.' "'Yes,' answered Marcia laconically. Jack glanced at her keenly. "'Is there anything new in the Christmas line?' he asked. The gray eyes grew black and the red spots burned again as Marcia replied, "'Well, I should think so. He proposes to turn things topsy-turvy. "'My, what does he want to do?' inquired Cousin Augusta. "'Oh, he calls it the white gift Christmas, but the long and short of the matter is that he proposes to turn down Santa Claus and all the old time-honored customs connected with Christmas that are so dear to the hearts of the children and have the school do the giving. He has a big banner hung up in the Sunday school room bearing the words, Gifts for the Christ Child.' "'An excellent idea!' exclaimed Uncle John. "'But I don't see much of an innovation about that. You have always made the children's giving a part of your Christmas celebration, have you not?' "'Certainly!' rejoined Marcia. They have always brought their little gifts for the poor, and that is all right, but this time there are no gifts to the Sunday school at all. Not even to the primary school? asked Augusta. Well, admitted Marcia, Mr. Robinson gave the children their choice today, whether they would have the old Christmas or the white gift Christmas, and they all voted for the new idea. Why then should the children be obliged to have gifts if they don't want them? laughed Augusta. No, oh, children are always taken with novelty, and Mr. Robinson told it to them in such a way that fancy was captivated, but I don't think they really understood what they were giving up. Marcia, it seems to me that you are emphasizing the wrong side of the subject, if I understand it aright, said Jack. Why do you know about it? asked Marcia in surprise. Not much, replied Jack, but I've read the white gift story in the Sunday School Times and the report of the Painesville experiment. Well, Jack, tell us what you know about this mysterious white gift, commanded his father. I would rather Marcia should tell it, Father, I know so little. Oh, go on, Jack, urged Marcia. You can't possibly know less about it than I do, for I confess I was so full of the disappointment of the little ones that the other side of it didn't impress me very much. Well, as I remember it, said Jack, the gist of the plan is this, that Christmas is Christ's birthday and we should make our gifts to him instead of to one another, and the idea of the white gift was suggested by the story of the Persian king named Kubla Khan, who was a wise and good ruler and greatly beloved. On his birthday his subjects kept what they called the White Feast. This was celebrated in an immense great white banqueting hall, and each one of his subjects brought to their king a white gift to express that the love and loyalty of their hearts was without stain. The rich brought white chargers, ivory, and alabaster, the poor brought white pigeons, or even a measure of rice, and the great king regarded all gifts alike so long as they were white. "'Have I told it right, cousin?' queried Jack. "'Yes, I think so. It is a beautiful thought, I must confess, and might be all right in a large, rich Sunday school, but in a mission school like ours I am sure it will be a failure. It will end in our losing our scholars. I don't believe in taking up new ideas without considering whether they are adapted to our needs or not. But please, dear folkses, don't let us say anything more about it,' pleaded Marcia, and so the subject was dropped. That evening, as Jack Thornton bade his cousin good-bye, he placed in her hand a little package, saying, I'm so sorry, Marcia, that I can't be here for your birthday, but here's my remembrance. Now don't you dare open it before Tuesday, and, dear, you may be sure it is a white gift, and may you have a white birthday. And before she could say a word, he had opened the door and was gone. 
Touched by his thoughtful gift and his words, she said to herself, A white birthday! I always have perfectly beautiful birthdays. And so she did, for she was always looking out for other people's birthdays and making much of them. And so she always got the gospel measure. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall man give into your bosom. But these thoughts were crowded out by the pressure of things to be done. Father and mother had gone into the country to visit a sick friend, and the younger brothers and sisters surrounded her and clamored for songs and Bible stories, and as she was a good older sister she devoted herself to them until their bedtime. Then turning out the lights she sat down in an easy chair before the library grate, and yielded herself to the spell of the quiet hour. The strained, irritated nerves relaxed, and a strange, sweet peace stole over her. As she gazed dreamily into the fire a star seemed to rise out of the glowing coals and beam at her with a beautiful, soft radiance and the words of the evangel came into her mind. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. She repeated the words over and over to herself. How simple and restful they were! How direct and genuine and satisfying was this old-time giving! There it was, gifts for the Christ child. They presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. She remembered reading somewhere that the gold represented our earthly possessions, the frankincense typified our service, and the myrrh our suffering for his sake. As she gazed into the fire and mused, she fell asleep, and all these thoughts were woven into the fabric of a dream. And who shall say that God does not speak to his children still in dreams? She dreamed that it was the morning of her birthday. She heard cheery voices in the hall calling out to one another, this is Marcia's birthday. Wish you many returns of the day. There was an excited running to and fro between the different rooms and gleeful exclamations, but no one came near her. She sat up in bed listening and wondering what it could mean. Why, mother always came into her room and folded her to her heart and said those precious things that only a mother can say, and the children always scrambled to see who should be the first to give sister a birthday kiss. Were they playing some joke on her? She would be quiet and watch, and so not be taken unawares. Presently they went trooping happily downstairs into the dining room, and she heard father's voice say, "'Good morning, children. I wish you many happy returns of Marcia's birthday.' What did it all mean? Was she going crazy? Or were they just trying to surprise her by some novel way of celebrating her birthday? She arose and with trembling fingers dressed herself hastily, and stole softly down the stairs and looked into the dining room. Hush, father was asking a blessing. He returned thanks for dear Marcia's birthday, and asked that it should be a happy day for them all. Beside each plate save her own were various packages, and these were opened amid ejaculations of surprise and pleasure, and sundry hugs and kisses. After the first burst of happiness had subsided, Marcia braced herself and entered the dining room, saying with forced gaiety, "'Good morning, dear ones all.' They looked up with blank, unanswering faces and said, "'Good morning, Marcia.' That was all. But Marcia's heart leaped at the recognition of her presence, for she had begun to fear that she was dead and that it was her spirit that was wandering about. She stooped and kissed her mother, who murmured abstractedly, "'Yes, dear,' never once looking up from the presence she was examining. With a sinking heart she turned away from her mother and went and stood behind her father's chair, and leaning over whispered in his ear, "'Dear father, have you forgotten that this is my birthday?' He answered kindly but absent-mindedly, "'Why, daughter, am I likely to forget it with all these tokens around me?' And he waved his hand toward the gifts piled around his plate. This was almost more than Marcia could bear for father was always specially tender and attentive to her on her birthday. She always sat on his knee a while, and he told her what a joy and comfort she was to him, and he always paid her some pretty compliment that made her girlish heart swell with innocent pride, for every girl knows that compliments from one's father are a little sweeter than any others. In vain she hung around, waiting for some clue to this mysterious, unnatural conduct of the family. They were all absorbed in plans for spending this birthday, Marcia's birthday, but no reference whatever was made to what she liked. No one consulted her as to what she wanted to do or to have done. The boys were going skating in the forenoon, the little girls were to invite four of their friends to help serve the first dinner in the new doll's house, and in the afternoon father would take them all for an automobile ride into the country to a dear friend's, all but Marcia, who couldn't bear to get into an auto since a terrible accident she had been in a few weeks ago. A troop of her girl friends came in and in a conventional way wished her many happy returns of the day, and then proceeded to ignore her, and gave gifts to other members of the family. It is a wonder, thought Marcia bitterly, that they didn't have a birthday party for Marcia with Marcia left out. And so it went on all through that strange, miserable day. 
While they were all busy celebrating her birthday, she herself was neglected and ignored. As she sat in the quiet house alone in the twilight, for she had no heart to light the gas, just homesick for the personal love which had characterized all her birthdays and all her home life heretofore, there came a timid knock on the door, and as Marcia opened it, there stood little crippled Joe, one of her scholars in the Mission Sunday School. As he saw her, he gave a little exclamation of surprise and delight and said, "'Oh, Miss Marshy, I heard last night twas your birthday today, and I wanted to give you something white, like Mr. Robinson he told us about, don't you know? And cause you're as all as treated me so white, and, and I didn't have nothing, and so I asked him, you know, what you told us about in Sunday school, Jesus, who died on the cross, and who's allers willing to help a poor fella, and I asked him to help me get something real nice and white for your birthday, and I kept me eyes peeled all day expecting it, and just now a real swell feller bite a paper of me, and then he gave me this here bunch of white sweet smellin' posies without my saying a word. Here they be, Miss Marshy, for your Jiminy teacher ain't them purty? And oh teacher, he made em in the fust place, and had the man give em to me, and so I reckon he and me's partners in this here white gift business. And he held up in his thin grimy hand a bunch of white sweet scented violets. Marcia's first impulse was to catch up the little fellow and his gift in her arms and baptize them with a flood of tears from her own overcharged heart. But she hadn't taught boys in a mission Sunday school class for nothing. Joe would have thought she had gone crazy or been struck silly or was sick unto death. So she controlled herself and kneeling beside him took the violets reverently in both her hands, saying in a choked voice, "'Joe, they are just beautiful. This is the only really truly white gift I have had today, and I don't deserve it. But I thank him and you." The boy looked at her with shining face, drew his hand across his eyes, and then answered brightly, "'Oh, that's all right, Miss Marshy. Tenny right tis with me, and I reckon tis with him.' And seizing his crutch, he hopped like a little sparrow through the door and onto the street, and she heard his boyish voice calling out, "'Evening papers, last edition, all about the big graft exposure.' Just then the big white touring car discharged its merry load at the door, and the house was filled with the chatter and laughter of the children. In vain she tried to find a quiet corner where she could be alone with her heart. It was impossible to escape from the hilarious celebration of her birthday. She was so glad when the children said good night and went off to bed and she could seek the quiet of her own room. As she bade her father good night, he said, "'Well, daughter, I hope you have enjoyed your birthday and all your gifts.' At this, all the honesty of her nature, all the hatred of sham, rose up in one indignant outburst, and she exclaimed, "'I have had no gifts. Neither has this been my birthday celebration.' "'Why, Marcia,' said her father in an aggrieved tone, "'this certainly is your birthday, and we have been very happy in keeping it for love of you.' "'I have failed to see any manifestation of love to me,' retorted Marcia. "'You may have had a happy time, but I have not been in it. You have given gifts to one another, but I have had just one,' and she held up the bunch of violets. "'This is a gift of love from little lame Joe in answer to his prayer and in pity for my hungry heart.' There was silence in the room for a moment and then her father answered, "'It seems to me, daughter, that when you get right down to a personal application, what you believe in, after all, is a white birthday.' The words went through her like an electric shock, and with a start she awoke and sat upright in her chair, and lo, it was all a dream. Marcia looked around the room, shook herself a little, stirred the fire, and put on fresh coal. She laughed at the remembrance of her dream and its absurdity. How glad she was that it was only a dream! But was it only a dream? Was it not a reality? Was not this the way she had kept the Lord's birthday? When she had opened her Christmas treasure, how much had been given him and for love of him? How large a place had she given him in the season's activity? Had she ever made room for him as the central figure of it all? Or had he been crowded out, and his rightful place given to Santa Claus and the world's merrymaking? In the light of the Spirit she saw that the Star of Bethlehem always leads to the cross of Calvary. She had never liked to think about the cross before, but now it was all illumined with the glory of the love which gave to us God's best, His only begotten Son. She remembered how the Lord Jesus had said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. She saw that it is as we see Christ on the cross for us that we are drawn to Him. In that still hour, on her knees, at the foot of the cross, Marcia, with great gladness, made her first white gift unto her Lord. She gave herself to Him. End of her Birthday Dream by Nellie C. King